So, you know, there are unfortunately separated Protestant brothers and sisters in the world and Christian community who reject the papacy, which is the rock on which the church was built, St. Peter. You know, of course, Protestants are quick to say, you know, they're quick to object already to the fact, the obvious fact, that Jesus is the rock of the church in the broader sense. And the cornerstone, too, despite St. Paul writing in the book of Ephesians uh, 3.20, that the apostles are the cornerstone. So, you know, it was Simon Peter who had his name changed, hinting at a clear sign in mission change by our Lord, uh, was given the keys to the kingdom of heaven, the ability to bind and loose authoritative teachings in a way no other apostle had in his supreme role of leadership service. You know, I've made my case in numerous essays on, on other arguments for the biblical reasons to believe Peter had supremacy. But to show this was a continuing office meant for all the faithful to follow, and that this indeed go beyond Peter in history, we must look to the extra-biblical early church historical evidence to affirm or deny this claim. You know, I believe the evidence is in favor of the papacy amongst the early church and virtually all other Catholic doctrines, if I'm being honest with you. But the papacy, to quote Catholic Answers apologist and writer uh, Joe Heschmeyer, great book, um, um, it's the most distinctive doctrine. And, you know, Protestant brethren reject the papacy, but if this is so, they reject what Jesus has established. But Jesus told his apostles, whoever listens to you listens to me. Whoever rejects you rejects me, and whoever rejects me rejects him who sent me. In Luke ten sixteen. And it was written in the book of Hebrews, Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God, consider the outcome of their life, and imitate their faith. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as men who will have to give account. Let them do this joyfully and not sadly, for that would be of no advantage to you. Hebrews thirteen seven and 17. And Jesus told Simon Peter in a unique way, You are Cephas meaning rock, and on this rock I will build my church, my church, the church, one church founded by Jesus, and the gates of Hades, hell, will not overcome it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven, per Matthew sixteen eighteen through 19. Now, when the apostles debate amongst one another, you know, who's the greatest? And Jesus tells them it is the one who serves, and you know, though he will have to go away soonly. He tells Simon Peter, though, in a unique way about his you know, leadership role and service, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail, and when you have turned your back, strengthen your brothers. Luke 22, 31-32. You know, it's Simon Peter who Jesus tells to feed his sheep in John 21 and whom fishers of men will be made after it is he who catches the miraculous fish uh, with the help of Jesus, of course, Mark one seventeen, Matthew 4.19. And again, the papacy is already established by the time that the apostles have you know, written the Bible, the, the books of the Bible, decades after their journey with Jesus, though in a reliable way, I might add. And thus, it doesn't elaborate more further on already existing presbyters, bishops, deacons, the papacy, and what have you, in the same way the Constitution didn't elaborate or touch further on uh, what a governor should do, because these already existed. And of course, uh, this would have all occurred long before the Bible had officially been canonized in full by the Catholic Church in 382 at the Council of Rome, uh, was reaffirmed by the regional councils of Hippo 393 and Carthage 397, and then definitively reaffirmed by the Ecumenical Council of Florence in 1442, long before the Protestant Reformation. And the only uh, complete noted New Testament canon we had came in a letter by St. Athanasius, in the year 367, even though they thought individual books might have been divinely inspired. So let us take a look at the extra-biblical early church historical evidence to assess the papal claims made by Catholics. So Pope Clement I was the fourth pope, following Peter, Linus, and Anacletus. And some of his writings were even, you know, considered scripture and read aloud in the early church gatherings, or what we Catholics call the Mass. Uh, he said this, Owing to the sudden and repeated calamities 
and misfortunes which have befallen us, we must acknowledge that we have been somewhat tardy in turning our attention to the matters in dispute among you, beloved and especially that abominable and unholy sedition, alien and foreign to the elect of God, which a few rash and self-willed persons have inflamed, such madness that your venerable and illustrious a uh, name worthy to be loved by all men has been greatly defamed. Accept our counsel, and you will have nothing to regret. If anyone disobey the things which have been said by him, God, through us, the church, that you must reinstate your leaders, let them know that they will involve themselves in transgressions and in no small danger. You will afford us joy and gladness if being obedient to the things which we have written through the Holy Spirit, you will root out the wicked passion of jealousy. And so this is obviously showing the fact that Rome has supremacy. He is the Pope there. And in the midst of heresy, the church and Rome with the, you know, the papacy, the Pope as its head is the one who solves these disputes. Now, St. Ignatius of Antioch lived in the second century, the first half of the century, second century and the early half. Uh, was taught by Polycarp, who was a student of John the Apostle. He served as a bishop of Antioch and was martyred and died in 108-140 AD, depending on which calendar means we use. He was a fervent early church defender of many distinctive Catholic beliefs and arduously based his writings on that which was taught by the apostles to their teachers and his teachers, really, which was passed down to him. He wrote Ignatius to the church also which holds the presidency in the location of the country of the Romans, worthy of God, worthy of honor, worthy of blessing, worthy of praise, worthy of success, worthy of sanctification, and because you hold the presidency in love, named after Christ and named after the Father. Ignatius also wrote, You, the church at Rome, have envied no one but others you have taught. I desire only that which you have and joined in your instructions may remain in force. Now, St. Irenaeus of Lyons is another one who, like Ignatius, was a prime early church defender of Catholic dogma. He lived from 130 AD to 202 AD. You know, he brilliantly wrote against heresies for the precise reason of defending apostolic succession and teachings and condemning heresy. Irenaeus succeeded the martyr St. Pothinus and became the second bishop of Lyon. And here's what he said about the one true church found in Catholicism. As I have already observed, the church having received this preaching and this faith, although scattered throughout the whole world, yet as if one, occupying but one house carefully preserves it. She also believes these points of doctrine, just as if she had but one soul and one and the same heart, and she proclaims them and teaches them and hands them down with perfect harmony, as if she possessed only one mouth. Now he also noted the Catholic Church possesses one and the same faith throughout the whole world, as we have already said, against heresies 110. Now, on the primacy of Rome and the Pope who resides there in the Holy See, Irenaeus wrote this, Since, however, it would be very tedious in such a volume as this to reckon upon the successions of all the churches, we do put to confusion all those who, in whatever manner, whether by an evil self-pleasing by vainglory or by blindness and perverse opinion, assemble in unauthorized meetings, we do this, I say, by indicating that tradition derived from the apostles of the very great, the very ancient, and universally known church founded and organized at Rome by the two most glorious apostles, Peter and Paul, as also by pointing out the faith preached to men, which comes down to our time by means of the successions of the bishops, for it is a matter of necessity that every church should agree with this church on account of its preeminent authority. Talking about Rome. The blessed apostles then have founded and built up the church committed into the hands of Linus, the office of the episcopate. Eleutherus uh, does now in the twelfth place from the apostles hold the inheritance of the episcopate. In this order and by this succession, the ecclesiastical tradition from the apostles and the preaching of the truth have come down to us, and this is the most abundant proof that there is one and the same vivifying faith which has been preserved in the church from the apostles until now and handed down in truth against heresies 3.3. Now what does it tell you just a few decades after Peter 
Early church fathers like Irenaeus and Ignatius are giving entire lists of bishops of Rome and describing church hierarchy. I think it shows there's one true church, but I'm getting ahead of myself. There is much more than quotations to consider regarding historical evidence for Rome's supremacy in the papacy. Pope Victor I, who reigned from 189 to 199 AD, was in a heated dispute with the bishops of Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, over the dating of Easter. The bishops of the West, including Pope Victor, wanted uniformity in the church and agreed to have a common Easter celebration on Sunday. He declared that the mystery of the resurrection of the Lord should be celebrated on no other day but the Lord's Day, and we should observe the close of the Paschal fast on this day only. This is precisely what, you know, along with interpreting the Bible infallibly and giving correct, correct teachings on matters of faith and morals, not to mention canonizing the Bible, popes are positioned to do. Sola Scriptura is simply insufficient, and for Protestants who say the main things of salvation are the plain things in the Bible, and the plain things in the Bible are simply, you know, the main things for salvation, downplay and ignore greatly relevant disputes and debates really amongst Protestant denominations over matters of importance needs like baptism, the nature of baptism, the nature of communion, saint veneration, and more, possibly even the day in which the Lord resurrected potentially. So this is why we have the magisterium of the church, sacred tradition, and sacred scripture in Catholicism. To quote a famous early church father, even if the apostles had not left their writings to us, Ought we not follow the rule of the tradition which they handed down to those to whom they committed the churches? Many barbarian peoples who believed in Christ follow this rule, the message of their salvation written in their hearts by the Spirit without paper and ink. And that was St. Irenaeus of Lyons, and it is so true. Now, getting back to our example of Pope Victor, the bishops of Asia Minor dissented. They responded not to the various synods and councils, but in a letter addressed to Victor in the Church of Rome, which declared that we ought to obey God rather than man, Acts 5.29. Sounds all too familiar to Protestant objections today to Catholicism and the papacy, despite the fact that 2 Thessalonians 2.15 says, So then, brothers and sisters... Stand firm and hold fast to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. But the early church Christians didn't have the canonized Bible for three centuries and only circulating scripture notations throughout. So what would they do to reach the faith and share it to others? They used sacred tradition with oral teachings from Jesus and the apostles and the church magisterium, of course. Pope Victor's response was this. Eusebius, a Greek Christian historian, records that he immediately attempted to cut off from the common unity the parishes of all Asia and with the churches that with agreed with them as heterodox, and he wrote letters and declared that all brethren there wholly excommunicate. St. Irenaeus of Lyon, one of the Pope's allies in setting Sunday uh, for Easter, uh, successfully acted as, quote, a peacemaker in this matter, exhorting and negotiating in this way in behalf of the peace of these churches. You know, this shows in the second century, the Pope had a sense of jurisdiction and supreme authority that was clearly noted for all. The martyrs of Lyons said, and the same martyrs too commended Irenaeus already at that time, AD 175, as presbyter of the community of Lyons, to the said Bishop of Rome, rendering abundant testimony to the man, as the expressions following expressions show. Once more and always, we pray that you may rejoice in God, Pope Eleutherius. This letter we have charged our brother and companion Irenaeus to convey to you, and we beg you to receive him as zealous for the covenant of Christ. And in the third century, Pope Stephen appealed to Matthew sixteen eighteen through nineteen, situating Peter and then his successors as the rock on which Christ's church is built, in order to legitimize his enforcement of the Roman policy on baptism in North Africa. Saint Cyprian of Carthage noted, "The Lord says to Peter, I say to you, he says, that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it." And to you I will give the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever things you bind on earth shall be bound also in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth, they shall also be loosed in heaven. Matthew sixteen eighteen through 19 On him, Peter, he builds the church. And to him he gives 
gives the command to feed the sheep, John 21, 21, 17. And although he assigns a like power to all the apostles, yet he founded a single chair, cathedra, and he established by his own authority a source and intrinsic reason for that unity. Indeed, the others were also what Peter, the apostles, but a primacy is given to Peter, whereby it is made clear that there is but one church and one chair. So too all the apostles are shepherds, and the flock is shown to be one, fed by all apostles in a single-minded accord. If someone does not hold fast to this unity of Peter, can he imagine that he still holds the faith? If he should desert the chair of Peter, upon whom the church was built, can he still be confident that he is in the church? A.D. 251. He also noted, With a false bishop appointed for themselves by heretics, they dare even to set sail and carry letters from schismatics and blasphemers to the chair of Peter and to the principal church at Rome, in which sacerdotal unity has its source. The clearness of Peter's primacy is crystal. We're getting close chronologically, at least, to the time in which Constantine, the head of the Roman Empire, would legalize Christianity. This would occur in 312 AD, and unfortunately, some mistake this to believe he founded the Catholic Church. A view ignorant to the historical record, and after all that we've covered thus far, the organizational buildup of the church founded by Christ in apostolic succession for over three centuries. Ignatius, writing nearly two whole centuries earlier, notes, "...continue and imitate union with Jesus our God." And the bishop and the enactments of like apostles in like manner, let all revere the deacons as an appointment of Jesus Christ and the bishop as Jesus Christ, who is the son of the father and the presbyters as the Sanhedrin of God and assembly of the apostles. Apart from these, there is no church. And we've already, you know, demonstrated several men holding the title of Pope and in demonstrating papal authority. Uh, prior to Constantine's legalization of Christianity in the Roman Empire. In fact, the church was operating underground and facing enormous persecution uh, during this time, but it wasn't simply believers, a body of believers of the faith being attacked by the empire and its leaders, uh, but also those in the church hierarchy. Another mistaken notion is that Constantine exercised complete control over the First Council of Nicaea in 325, but livingbreadradio.com responds to these uh, claims brilliantly with a series of arguments to debunk it, so here was my favorite quote from it. If by virtue of Constantine calling a general council of all the bishops of the church to meet with him at Nicaea, a resort town in the hills of Asia Minor, just south of Constantinople, a church was created, it then fo- therefore follows that a... The church that existed prior to the council from which all the bishops were called merged themselves into the new church of Constantine. Uh, B, we should see no continuity between the pre-existing church and the new church. C, we should see no continuity between the pre-Nicaea church and the modern-day Catholic church. They noted if, by virtue of Constantine issuing an edict of religious freedom for Christians and calling together the first council of Nicaea, means that he started the Catholic Church. It would therefore mean that any time a Roman emperor granted religious freedom to any religion or stepped in to resolve their controversies, that they had become the founder of that pagan or Jewish religion. We don't see such a claim about by Protestants about the emperor of Rome in any other circumstance than that with the Catholic Church. In addition, this assumption also fails to recognize that the Roman emperor thought himself in charge of all things in his empire. Therefore, it would have been natural and welcomed uh, for the emperor to extend his leverage and protection uh, to assemble together all of the Catholic bishops of the Roman Empire. But really, the burden of proof is on the Protestant who rejects the papacy and the authority of the Catholic Church, claiming Jesus didn't found the Catholic Church, to tell me and us Catholics who, when, and where It was founded then, if not by Jesus with Peter, with Rome having supremacy, and with authority not limited to Rome. But continuing onward, the 5th century Vincent de Lawrence, a saint uh, both venerated by Catholics and Orthodox, the group that would unfortunately uh, fall into schism and out of communion with the church, uh, founded by Christ over largely cultural disputes, but over papal authority indeed as well. They said that uh, it was not only correct for Pope Stephen 
in correct in policy, but also in authoritative procedure over other bishops, and that's from the sixth chapter in his commandatorium. Both Stephen and Victor gave the impression of papal primacy and universal jurisdiction, and shortly after, uh, Fermilian, the bishop of Caesarea, Mazaka from uh, 232, who was a disciple of Origen and eventually died in 269 AD in Turkey, noted, Pope Stephen boasts of the place of his episcopate and contends that he holds the succession from Peter, on whom the foundations of the church were laid, Matthew 16, 18. Stephen announces that he holds by succession the throne of Peter. Now, in the 4th century, Eastern Provincial uh, Councils were overturned by the annulments enacted by the authority of the Roman court. The Council of Sardica, which is also known for attempting to resolve the Arian heresy and attended by 170 bishops, insisted that such uh, was appropriate since the Roman See, as the See of Peter, was the head of all the bishops in the East and the West. Uh, Athanasius the Great uh, was present, present and uh, subscribed to its decrees that this clearly shows the legal authority of Rome's disciplinary and doctrinal court in light of a continued possession of Peter's primacy and apostolic succession. And that this uh, primacy was held superior to even councils is clear from the testimony of Pope Innocent I, who wrote the following in 416 AD. Whatever is done, even if it be in the distant provinces, should not be ended without being brought to this knowledge of this see in Rome that by its authority the whole just pronouncement should be strengthened. And Pope Julius I uh, said this in 341 AD, The judgment concerning Athanasius ought to have been made, not as it was, but according to the ecclesiastical canon. It behooved all of you to write uh, us uh, so that the justice of it might be seen as a manting emanating uh, from all, are you ignorant that the custom has been to write first to us and then for a just decision to be passed from this place, Rome? If then any such suspicion rested upon the bishop of there, Athanasius of Alexandria, notice of it ought to have been written to the church here. But now, after having been done as they pleased, they want to obtain concur our concurrence, although we never condemned him. Not thus are the constitutions of Paul, not thus the traditions of our fathers, for this is another form of procedure and a novel practice. What I write about this is for the common good. For what we have heard from the blessed Apostle Peter, these things I signify to you. And this was in AD 341. St. Optatus wrote, You cannot then deny that you do know that upon Peter first in the city of Rome was bestowed the Episcopal Cathedra, on which sat Peter, the head of all the apostles, for which reason he was called Cephas, that in this one cathedral unity should be preserved by all, lest the other apostles might claim each for himself separate cathedrals, so that he would set uh, up a second cathedral against the unique cathedral, would already be a schismatic and a sinner. Well then, on the one cathedral, which is the first of the endowments, Peter was the first to sit. To Peter succeeded Linus, to Linus succeeded Clement, to Clement succeeded Anacletus, to Anacletus Averistus, to Averistus Sixtus, to Sixtus Telesiphorus, to Julius Liberius, to Liberius Damasus, to Damasus Syracus, who today is our colleague, with whom the whole world, through the intercourse of letters of peace, agrees with us in one bond of communion. Now do you show the origin of your cathedra, you who wish to claim the Holy Church for yourselves, talking about the schism in 367 AD. The presbyter Philip stated at the Council of Ephesus uh, in 431, which is an ecumenical to both uh, Catholic and Orthodox, that Christ divinely singled out Peter as the block foundation bearer of the keys of the kingdom of heaven, head of the apostles, and the whole of the church who today and forever lives and judges in his successors. And this was read aloud both in Latin and Greek, and was inscribed into the official acts of the council. Now, when Emperor uh, Theodosius uh, convened the Council of Ephesus in 449 AD, Flavian of Constantinople appealed over its court to the throne of Peter uh, in order to annul its decrees. And this uh, perhaps is the clearest uh, instance of a saint and a pope uh, appealing to the privilege of Rome in order to check uh, the ecumenical decrees of an ecumenical council. 
In the third session of the Council of Chalcedon, uh, the official sentence of excommunication against Theocrasis, uh, the Patriarch of Alexandria, states that Pope Leo threw the council together with the thrice-blessed and all-glorious Peter, who the Apostle is the rock of the Church and foundation of the Catholic Church, and the foundation of the Orthodox faith, has stripped Theocrasis of his episcopate. Now, clearly, the text from Matthew, which invested Peter with the universal primacy of jurisdiction, is here to be understood to be living and active in the enforced authority of his successor, Leo, and all his successors. In Sermon 51, Leo states that, of all things which are petitioned in the church, only that should be ratified in heaven, which had been settled uh, by the judgment of Peter. Now, this is why Leo felt qualified to annul the 28th canon of Chalcedon uh, by the authority of St. Peter. In letter 14, Leo says, Although there are many pastors and bishops in the universal church, all should converge towards Peter's one seat, and no one anywhere should be separated from its head. And this is clearly referring to the Apostolic See, uh, See of Rome, which historically noted is supreme. And in the 6th century, uh, a 30-year schism, actually, between Rome and the Eastern churches was healed uh, by a universal subscription to a formula put down uh, by Pope Hormistus um, in 519 AD. And in that formula, it was clearly enunciated uh, that the divine promise of our Lord to protect his church uh, was through the instrumentality of preserving Peter's uh, faith in the teaching ministry of the Apostolic See uh, of Rome, which is the rock and solidity of of the whole Christian religion, and countless bishops of both East and West signed this formula and returned in full communion uh, with the Church. So concerning this formula, Orthodox theologian uh, Alexander uh, Schliemann, an author, uh, stated the characteristic of this eternal compromise with Rome was the signing of the formula uh, of Hormistas, uh, by the Eastern Bishops of 519, ending the 30-year schism between Rome and Constantinople, the whole essence of the papal claims cannot be more clearly expressed than in this document, which was imposed upon uh, the Eastern Bishops. Now, at the Council of Lateran in 649, the Eastern Bishop Stephen Ador of Dor, a unique disciple of Sepharonius uh, of Jerusalem, described how he and Sepharonius uh, were of the mind that in order to squelch the monothelite heresy in the East, they must appeal to the uh, Roman See, quote, that rules and presides over all others, I mean your sovereign and supreme See. It has been accustomed to perform this authoritatively from the first and from of old on the basis of its apostolic and canonical authority for the reason evidently that the true great Peter, the head of the apostles, was deemed worthy not only to be entrusted to be alone out of all of the keys to the kingdom of heaven, uh, but also uh, because he was the one, the first to be entrusted uh, with shepherding uh, the sheep of the whole Catholic Church. As the text runs, Peter, do you love me? Shepherd my sheep. And again, because he possessed more than all the others in an exceptional and unique way, firm and an unshakable faith in our Lord, he was deemed worthy to turn and strengthen his brethren and his comrades and spiritual brethren uh, when they were wavering since providentially he had been adorned uh, by, by God uh, who became incarnate for our sakes with power and priestly authority over all of them. In the 8th century, Pope Hargrian I sent dogmatic letters to be read aloud at the Council of Nicaea in which he states, For the blessed Peter himself, the chief of the apostles, who first sat in the apostolic sea, left the chief ship of his apostolate and the pastoral care to his successors, who are to sit in his most holy seat forever. And this was also, again, to note, read aloud both in Greek and Latin and inscribed in the official acts of Nicaea to session two. And according to Orthodox theologian Father Lauren Cleanwork, uh, concerning Hadrian's letter, the Eastern bishops gave total recognition that the Pope of Rome held Peter's see and that Rome was in a unique way heir, uh, heir to Christ's promises to Peter. In the book, His Broken Body, Cleanworks also says that since at least 250 AD, the Roman Church has officially consistently taught 
that her bishop is the successor of Peter in a unique sense and that he holds by divine right a primacy of power over the universal church. Now, this was expressed consistently and unambiguously by a number of popes still commemorated as saints in the Orthodox Church, including such luminaries as Agatha and Hadrian. As we have seen, this ecclesiology was accepted by a number of even Eastern saints. At the Council of Constantinople in 681, Pope Agatha's letter was approved by the Greeks as the voice of Peter. And in that letter, letter, Agatha stated that the Roman Church had never turned away from the path of truth in any direction of error, whose authority as that of the Prince of the Apostles, the whole Catholic Church, and the ecumenical senates have faithfully embraced and followed in all things. He goes on to say that the teaching of Rome remains undefined until the end according to the divine promise of the Lord and Savior himself, and then cites Christ's promise to Peter in Luke twenty two thirty one through 32 Protestant historian uh, Philip Schaff wrote, Agatha quotes the words of Christ to Peter in favor of papal infallibility, anticipating as if it were the Vatican decision of 1870. So we've basically covered much of the millennium, and by looking at the early church historical evidence for the papacy in this, uh, I think uh, we have seen that it has clearly been well established in this time period, along with the infallibility of the Pope under certain circumstances, such as invoking ex cathedra with the intent of binding it to the church uh, for areas of faith and morals. And this is historically and biblically uh, justifiable. But first, let's note, all of this is a few hundred years before the schism of the Orthodox community and 1,000 to 1,500 years before the Protestant Reformation and its theology came to be in existence. And a good book uh, I'd suggest all read is The Early Church Was the Catholic Church by Joe Heschmeyer, who also wrote uh, Pope Peter. And these early church fathers and figures throughout the ages of the Christian faith not only affirm papal authority, you know, authority and infallibility, they explicitly teach and preach Catholic theology on baptism, on the nature of the worship uh, through the Eucharist, on how they mass should operate, on the necessity of of confession for uh, reconciliation and the forgiveness of sins, church hierarchy, and beyond. Uh, but this is not the record, unfortunately, that other Christian denominations save Orthodox, who unfortunately reject papal infallibility and Peter's successors now, and thus have fallen into schism and are not in communion uh, with the continued apostolic succession that they shared with Catholics and share, uh, realize and embrace, and Mormons you know, whose view on the Trinity uh, is, makes them, the church consider them not Christian at all or recognizable at all. I uh, believe that the church had a falling away following the death of the apostles committing apostasy and heresy. Protestants believe that a visible church with hierarchy never even existed despite the fact that the papacy and even papal infallibility and the trident structure of the church with priest, deacon, and bishop through the course of ecumenical councils and decrees is noted significantly throughout history and even though Ignatius wrote in the early 2nd century, continue in imitating union with Jesus Christ our God and the bishop and the enactments of the apostles in like manner, let all revere deacons as an appointment of Jesus Christ and the bishop as Jesus Christ, who is the son of the father, and the presbyters as the Sanhedrin of God, an assembly of the apostles. Apart from these, there is no church. So Ignatius, uh, he writes these things, or Aeneas, who wrote, True knowledge is that which consists in the doctrines uh, and doctrine of the apostles and the ancient constitution of the church uh, throughout all the world and the distinctive manifestation of the body of Christ according uh, to the successions of the bishops by which they have handed down that church which exists in every place and has come even unto us, being guarded and preserved without any forging of scriptures by a very complete system of doctrine, and neither receiving addition nor suffering curtailment in the truths which she believes, and against heresies 433, and in against heresies 34, noting uh, on church authority, suppose there arise a dispute relative to some important question among us, uh, should we not have the recourse to the most ancient churches with which the apostles held constant intercourse, and learned from them what is certain and clear in regard to the present question. Now, to be clear, Mormonism is a faith far more distorted and, dare I say, heretical than Protestantism. Uh, however, wouldn't it make more sense 
uh, to claim that the church committed apostasy and fell away than to deny the entire historical record affirming Catholic hierarchy and theology in the church, like Protestant brethren do. Uh, but this, this is what they say, that the church historical record uh, notes it's not the same as the Roman Catholic Church today, that's what they say. While Rome is the supreme right, it is in communion with all Catholic Church rights and is meant to be the authority for the whole world, uh, not merely Christians, and its job is to bring them in communion with it and thus with God as well. But some say uh, Pope Francis is a globalist liberal and he is her a heretic, really. But, uh, and others say, how could you accept Pope Francis, Grant? He's strict against the traditional Latin Mass, which uh, you like to attend, reportedly. Some go so far to say, Vatican II taught heresy and is false. Just look at John Paul II. He even kissed the Quran. Now, Vatican II is, in fact, binding to the Church and the faithful um, who must accept it. And it certainly did not teach heresy, um, even if you are a fan of the new liturgical reforms and means of conducting the Mass in the Norvis Ordo, which you have a right to uh, preference the traditional Latin Mass over. Uh, and changes to the sacraments and certain implementation means of the council since then, it did not and could not have taught heresy. The dogmatic constitution of the church, uh, Lumen Genitum, uh, from Vatican II noted this, taking conciliar custom into consideration and also the pastoral purpose of this present council, the sacred council defines as binding on the church only those matters in faith and morals, which it shall openly declare to be binding. The rest of the things which the sacred council sets forth, inasmuch as they are the teachings of the church's supreme magisterium, ought to be accepted and embraced by each and every one of Christ's faithful according to the mind of the sacred council. The mind of the council becomes known either from the matter treated or from its manner of speaking in accordance with the norms of theological interpretation. So, to be clear, the church cannot teach heresy and bind the faith to error, which it didn't in Vatican II and will never do, even if public actions by the head of the church, the Pope, make statements contradictory to the faith or show well-intended but bad optical remarks, such as the Pope St. John Paul II situation, or their comments as private theologians or individuals on political affairs or personal matters that you may disagree with on your own freely, such is the case with me uh, for Pope Francis at times on several areas, though many of his statements are falsely twisted by the liberal media and his conservative and objectively based and true ones ignored. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's been bad popes throughout history, and the church has still continued for 2,000 years throughout history since the time of Christ uh, to be the model as a shining city on a hill that Matthew 5.14 describes. There have been bad popes. Uh, there have been bad popes that have, you know, been adulterers, that have been, you know, ordered murders against innocent civilians, and even a pope who put one of his predecessors on trial in spite of the con inconvenient fact that the defendant had been dead for nine months. So, you know, I recently wrote a great essay, uh, which I will link below in this video if you're watching this, defending the valid authority of the church, despite the fact that some of its clergymen were engaged in disgusting and wicked acts like child uh, sexual abuse and pedophilia, essentially. So surely it is a bad look for the church, but it doesn't invalidate its authority. And it doesn't for this reason. I noted the Mormon view on apostasy and made more sense. But have they forgotten the promise of our Lord? Jesus says to Peter, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell, Hades, will not overcome it. Matthew sixteen eighteen. The gates of Hades, hell, will not overcome it, the church. Did Jesus fail? Why would Jesus establish his definitive church meant for all time to be a shining city on a hill until his second coming, just for his church to fail by the time his own apostles died, as Mormons allege? Jesus promised his apostles, if you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept, accept him, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, 
you will also live. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives you. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. John fourteen fifteen through 19, 25 through 27. Did the Lord fail on that promise? Did the Holy Spirit, equally God in the Trinity, who proceeds from the Father with the Son and the Son, led the church? Did he lead the church into error despite Jesus promising otherwise? Did Jesus fail in that promise? Did he lie? If the church committed apostasy, wouldn't that fall as contradictory to the nature of the Holy Spirit, who is the Spirit of truth and guides the church with Peter at its head? I think not. On talking about the infallibility of the Pope and the church he heads, which was founded by Jesus Christ our Lord, St. Francis de Sales wrote, And again, we must not think that in everything and everywhere his judgment is infallible, but then only when he gives judgment on a matter of faith and questions necessary to the whole church, for in particular cases which depend on human fact, he can err. There is no doubt. Though it is not for us to control him in these cases, save with all reverence, submission, and discretion. Theologians have said in a word that he can err in questions of fact, not in questions of right, that he can err extra cathedrum outside the chair of Peter, that is, as a private individual, by writings and bad example, but he, he cannot err when he is in cathedra, that is, when he intends to make an instruction and decree for the guidance of the whole church when he means to confirm his brethren as a supreme pastor and to conduct them into the pastors of the faith. For then it is not so much man who determines, resolves, and defines, as it is the blessed Holy Spirit by man, which spirit, according you know, to the promise made by our Lord to the apostles, teaches all truth to the church, and as the Greek says, and the church seems to understand in a collect of Pentecost, conducts and directs his church into all truth. But when that spirit of truth shall come, he will teach you all truth or will lead you into all truth. And how does the Holy Spirit lead the church except by the ministry and office of preachers and pastors? But if the pastors have pastors, they must also follow them, as all must follow him who is the supreme pastor, by whose ministry our God wills to lead not only the lambs and little sheep, but the sheep and mother of lambs, that is not not the people only, but also the other pastors. He succeeds St. Peter, who received this charge, feed my sheep. Thus it is that God leads his church into the pastures of his holy word, and in the exposition of this, he who seeks the truth under other leading loses it. The Holy Spirit is the leader of the church. He leads it by its pastor. He therefore, who not follows the pastor, follows not the Holy Spirit. You know, the Pope isn't perfect, but his office is valid because it was founded by the Lord who is perfect. In fact, Jesus calls Simon Peter like Satan, essentially, after, just after promising to give Peter the keys to the kingdom of heaven and calling him the rock of the church uh, when Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he, Jesus, turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not on the side of God, but of men. Matthew sixteen twenty two through 23. Now, Joe Heschmeyer, author of Pope Peter, defending the church's most distinctive doctrine in a time of crisis, wrote accurately and brilliantly, dare I say, on this in an article. So what does all this have to do with Peter and the papacy? There's one final reason to read these two parts of Matthew 16 as a single account, and it relates directly to the question of who the rock is of Matthew 16. Jesus refers to St. Peter as a hindrance to himself. The Greek word there is scandalon, the root word of our word scandal. And it literally means something that you trip over, like a trap stick or a stumbling stone. So there's a sort of play on words here. Peter, at his best, is a rock for the whole church, and at his worst, he's a stone that we can trip over. It's showing the two dis dimensions, really, to the papacy. It's an important locus uh, for the church, but it can also be scandalous. It's one of his earliest works on ecclesiology, 
Father Joseph uh, Ratzinger, a later Pope Benedict, obviously, would ask, has it not remained this way throughout all church history that the Pope, the successor of Peter, has been Petra and Scandalon, rock of God and stumbling stone, all in one? In a fascinating turn, the same Peter who Jesus names Petros and who he calls both a Petra and a Scandalon in Matthew 16 will return the favor. In 1 Peter 2.8, Peter refers to Jesus as both a Petra and Scandalon, a stone that will make men stumble and a rock that will make them fall. But here the connotation is different. He's not rebuking Christ. Rather, uh, Jesus is a scandal because of the scandal of the cross. In doing so, he echoes Jesus' words to himself, but with a new dimension. He's grasped the connection finally between Jesus' messiahship and the scandal of the cross. Finally, he's letting us know that Jesus really is God. Why? Because 1, 2, uh, 1 Peter 2, eight is also a quotation of, uh, of Isaiah 8.13-14. But the Lord of hosts, him you shall regard as holy, let him be your fear, let him be your dread, and he will become a sanctuary and a stone of offense, and a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel, a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So in Matthew 16, Jesus is clearly referring to Peter as both a rock and a scandal. But in saying this, we're not denying that Jesus is himself both a rock and a scandal, all but in a different way. Peter, the first head of the church, like the Pope at the head of the church throughout all time, including Francis today as our Pope, had to be criticized by other leaders such as St. Paul in Galatians 2, 11 through 14, got caught up in poor behavior, even denying Christ three times in Luke 22, 54 through 62, and even committed sinful actions. But the Pope can never teach inf- incorrectly on faith and morals when speaking ex cathedral uh, with the intent of binding it to the entire church. And even sins so awful and wicked as child sexual abuse uh, cannot and will not rebuke the authority of the church and its ability to teach on faith and morals correctly and infallibly, despite it bringing skepticism and scandal on itself and making it look hypocritical and even hellish at times. Archbishop Michael Sheehan said, Christ, the Son of God, founded a church to teach all mankind. He promised to be with her all days, even to the end of the world. Because of this perpetual help, his church must claim to teach people as he taught them. She must claim to be infallible in her teaching. The Catholic Church is the only religious body in the world that makes such a claim. She alone, therefore, is the church founded by Christ, the great antiquity of the Catholic Church, her marvelous growth, her unconquerable endurance, her wondrous holiness, her inexhaustible fruitfulness in all her charitable works, her power of holding her vast following together, despite every assault upon her unity, so that in despite of all her differences in race and culture and ambitions, they remain ever one in faith, in worship and obedience. It is a combination of all these characteristics that sets the church quite apart from merely human institutions and marks her plainly as the work of God. I hope we can now see that the church is in fact the Catholic Church, which is based in Rome. And the church really remains immaculate, and the papacy has been a widely historically noted established institution for all the Christian faithful in the entire world as the means to which the ministry of Christ, our Lord made flesh, can continue, who wants all the people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy 2.4. Perhaps some of the Christian faithful haven't seen the historical evidence for the papacy in a way that might bring about their conversion to Catholicism, and I and I largely agree most Protestants are in good faith trying to follow the scripture, uh, the scriptures rather, to the best of their ability. But in a way, that's also the problem. Not the trying to follow the scripture part, but the to the best of their ability part. Jesus founded a church that predated the canon of scripture, being distributed to all the faithful so that the contents of the scriptures and his ministry might be carried out correctly until his second coming rather than to one's best own ability and subjectively and gave the church the holy spirit and one person at the head of through the office of the papacy to be his vicar meaning representative until that time of the second coming in the book of acts the book which notes the early church's history and entailments an encounter between philip and an ethiopian strikes all too familiar to the situation in protestantism today the book of acts in chapter 8, verses 27, 31, reads, 
So he started out, and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch and an important official in charge of uh, all the treasury in Candate, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah and the prophet. Uh, the spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard this man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. You know, we're blessed by the Lord for having a church to teach us correctly on matters of faith and morals, even when they're human leaders in light of divine foundation and guidance and authority on faith teachings fall short in fulfilling the standards for moral behaviors themselves in the clergy. We want a church that tells us where we're wrong, not where we're right. St. Augustine, who died in 430, was one of the most brilliant theologians in church history, and he noted this, No man can find salvation except in the Catholic Church. Outside the Catholic Church, one can have everything except salvation. One can have honor. One can have the sacraments. One can sing alleluia. One can answer amen. One can have faith in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and preach it too. But never can one find salvation except in the Catholic Church. The papacy in it's really Catholicism's most distinctive doctrine, as Joe Hashmeyer noted, and I hope to that I've been able to lay out to you the reasons for believing in the papacy now. Come to Christ through his one holy Catholic and apostolic church, and let us work together to seek the unity as Christians that Christ desires for all his faithful, but through the truth. God bless you all. Christ is King.